All right, let's go over this one last time. This is Culver City, a little town in the LA area whose downtown in many aspects resembles a mall. Just like in a mall, downtown Culver puts a lot of interesting things close to each other. So just like a mall, people come here to shop, eat, work, and dance. But downtown Culver has one thing that malls don't have, and that's a busy congested road going right down the middle of it. A few years ago, Culver City decided that this road was too congested, so they decided to give bus riders and bicyclists their own lanes because they take up way less space than a single person in their personal car, truck, or SUV. Having fewer cars made it more pleasant to be a pedestrian here, but having fewer lanes made it miserable to be in a car, truck, or SUV during rush hour. So they voted to add another traffic lane to the corridor, hoping to make it less miserable. All this for only three to four hours of congestion, five days a week. The rest of the time, the roads were fine. The extra lane might relieve the bottleneck a little bit, but it'll probably just fill up with people driving on nearby Venice. So why did this happen? Well, this is a city and I'm not an urban planner, but if this city were a person, I'd call this a relapse. If someone were trying to change an unhealthy behavior, maybe they wanted to eat healthier or smoke less, there may be social, cultural, or biological barriers to them making that change, but those barriers may be hard to change immediately. And if those barriers aren't addressed, then there's a good chance that there will be a relapse. So until then, we accept that people won't change their behavior, and instead we come up with a plan for them to reduce the harm that behavior causes, an approach called harm reduction. For example, for the longest time there was a lot of resistance to banning indoor smoking. So what we did was we created smoking areas and non-smoking areas. That's harm reduction. Another example, nicotine is one of the most addictive substances known to man. But we provide smokers nicotine patches and nicotine gum so they could use that in a more controlled environment rather than lighting up and giving themselves cancer. Just like how smoking is bad for both smokers and the people around them, driving clearly isn't good for Culver City during rush hour. But there is a social barrier to people giving up their cars, and that's the fact that there's no other way to get between the east and west sides of LA. So how do we deal with traffic going through downtown Culver? One suggestion is to just ban cars from downtown Culver. Make this a non-driving zone and maybe make Venice Boulevard the driving zone. Kind of like how we have smoking zones and non-smoking zones. The only reason people want more lanes through downtown Culver is because they're driving here in the first place. Indoor smoking wasn't going to stop if we allowed some people to smoke sometimes in non-smoking areas. So banning cars would work, right? Just like with smoking, right? But if driving is the only practical way to get around, and we don't let anyone drive to downtown, how are we going to have a lively downtown? There are a lot of unique small businesses in downtown Culver City. Churchill Antiques, Armand's Fireplace and Barbecue Equipment, and The Ripped Bodice, a steamy romance novel bookstore that my girlfriend likes to go to. Mm -hmm. Ooh, Fox Thornton, you sly dog, you. Uh, I mean, it's totally my girlfriend who brings me here. On the surface, those businesses may not seem like they have anything in common, but they do share one issue. They all need a large market area. If you travel down Culver Boulevard, you'll notice that almost all the businesses here sell food. Foods for breakfast, foods for lunch and dinner, and food for second dinner. This shouldn't be surprising because everyone eats and most people eat multiple times a day. This means the market area for the business is rather small. You don't need to go very far from the business to find someone who needs the product the business is selling. But niche businesses like the Ripped Bodice need large market areas in order to stay afloat. People aren't buying steamy romance novels as frequently as they consume food. Armand's probably needs an even larger market area. I mean, how often are you buying a fireplace? The point is, the lower a store's purchasing frequency, the larger the market area needs to be in order to keep the store afloat. In America, we decided to build large, expensive, expansive roads in order to give these businesses access to their market area. Take this Trader Joe's for example. If it needs, say, 1,500 customers a day to stay afloat, it might need a market area that contains about 20,000 people. In a sparsely populated suburb like Santa Clarita, you're going to need ginormous roads in order to reach enough people to support this business and all the surrounding businesses. And when I say ginormous, I mean really wide. 
like wider than the actual freeway you would take to get there. And of course, all the cars taking those roads are going to need ginormous parking lots. And when I say ginormous, I mean the parking lots and roads take up more space than the actual buildings they serve. But a funny thing happens if you put that Trader Joe's in a neighborhood where there's fewer roads and more stuff nearby. If there are more homes, offices, and businesses around, that same Trader Joe's can get by with half as many residents in the same market area. And it's not just that a low density area has fewer people around and a high density area has more people around. You literally need fewer people living in the area if there's more stuff nearby. People might walk by the store on other outings, like on a lunch break from the office, or after getting dinner at a nearby restaurant, or before going to the park. People might stop by on the way to the train station, workers at the nearby hospital, visitors who come to meet up with friends, or shoppers who are attracted by the wide choice of stores, all produce unplanned visits, which allows this Trader Joe's and all the other stores here to rely less on local residents and more on passers-by. When people come to interesting places like downtown Culver, they're more likely to follow their human instinct to explore and discover, which doesn't really happen in a suburban strip mall in Santa Clarita, where you go to the store, get what you need, and get out of there because it's not a pleasant place to be. In more developed cities like London, you have so much stuff in any given neighborhood that when I visited last May, I would just stumble upon cool niche businesses like whiskey bars, jazz clubs, and Sri Lankan restaurants that were all thriving and run by people passionate about their craft, despite and because of a lack of space dedicated to cars. And because these places were designed for people rather than cars, they're way more interesting and pleasant to exist in, which encourages exploration and just overall happiness. These businesses are further supported by access to large market areas by a comprehensive subway system, but London's reputation of being friendly to local businesses far preceded the opening of its subway in the late 1800s. Almost a hundred years earlier, Napoleon was referring to England as a nation of shopkeepers. And it's kind of why America today is known as a nation of consumers, where most people get their bread from a factory headquartered a thousand miles away, rather than their local bakery down the street. Alright, thank you. Mmm, fresh bread. And it's why I worry about some of my favorite restaurants in LA. My favorite pizza place on the west side, Dough Room, isn't really around anything, so people aren't going to get the chance to just stumble upon their delicious meatballs and the she's my cherry tomato pie. My favorite Thai place is La La Rice, but like many restaurants in LA, the only way you end up here is if you somehow knew about their great Pad CU beforehand, not by spontaneously discovering it just because you were hanging out in the neighborhood, as you would in many other cities. And the only reason I know about my favorite Mexican spot on the west side, B Taqueria, is because it's right next to the climbing gym I go to, otherwise I'd have no idea it exists. And then there's my favorite Sri Lankan restaurant, Curry Pinch, which actually did close down because Mid Valley Auto Body Collision Center and Synthetic Grass Depot couldn't support them on their own. Their cotto roti and coconut risotto were fire though. And if you don't believe me about density supporting businesses, just follow the money. When large urban malls are designed, they use these exact same principles. Clothing stores, jewelry stores, movie stores, food stores, and container stores are put in close proximity together to benefit from unplanned visits, in essence emulating places like the neighborhoods of London. And they put all the cars out of sight and out of mind. A small business owner in Culver City actually told me that he hated the changes around downtown Culver because the removal of street parking made parking so inconvenient, even though downtown Culver has four large parking garages in close proximity. And it just made me imagine what kind of feedback the general public would give if they were designing shopping malls. This is awful! Why'd they put the parking so far away from everything? What am I supposed to do? Walk to Cheesecake Factory? Look at all this outdoor dining. It could be street parking. I'm sure this business is suffering without any parking nearby. This store could use better car accessibility. You know, one time I sprained my ankle and couldn't put any weight on it. It would have been nice if I could just park outside the entrance of stores. You tried to drive on a bad ankle? Well, look, 
Do you know any other way I can get around? Public transit? No one's going to take public transit even if it is clean and goes through interesting areas. And look at all this space dedicated to a trolley line that sits empty 99% of the time. What a waste. They should let cars go through here to ease congestion so people can get home earlier. Well-designed malls actually have a lot of design elements that make you comfortable as a pedestrian, encourage you to explore, and result in you spending more money. These include floors that are pleasant to walk on, a sense of enclosure, natural elements like greenery and water, places to sit. This mall even has a playground. How often do you see playgrounds in LA? And traffic calming with things like continuous sidewalks that signal to cars that they're entering a space for pedestrians rather than pedestrians stepping into a space for cars. As well as a generous use of bollards to separate spaces for cars from spaces for people. But when you let the general public design a space, you get this. This isn't to say that the mall should be the blueprint for making pedestrian-friendly spaces. A lot of malls don't really integrate well into their surrounding communities. When a mall looks like a fortress, you're not going to walk there. This lack of integration, where the only way to get here is by driving, just perpetuates our dependence on cars. The other problem with malls is that as more and more land is owned by just a few wealthy developers, it really takes away from the bargaining power of the actual businesses and leads to the concentration of wealth by those who own the property. And this just gets exacerbated when small mom and pop businesses can't afford the rent and end up getting replaced by national chains. This is why it's so important that we take these design elements that we know work, design elements that make it pleasant to exist as a person, in a place, and apply them to our neighborhoods and public spaces. By creating people-centered neighborhoods, we can create healthy communities that build wealth by supporting our local businesses. So how do we do that in Culver City? One idea is to close downtown to all car traffic. While a lot of online urban planning enthusiasts might rejoice at this idea, my fear is that if we go too far too fast, we might cause a relapse like what we're already seeing with these bus and bike lanes. So let's take a step back and try to understand what's going on in Culver City. Most importantly, Culver City is nothing if not a city of change. Founded as a whites-only town and promoted in the papers as a model little white city by its founder Harry Culver, it's now one of the most racially diverse regions in LA and home to one of the most racially diverse school districts in California. It also had this all railroads lead to Culver thing going on, being at the confluence of the Santa Monica Airline, the Venice Short Line, and this line going down Culver Boulevard. Apparently, they used to have a strong bike culture in Culver City even back then. This facade and this building actually still exist, but of course the rail line was paved over, as was the Venice Short Line. The Culver Palm Station that used to be here was, I think, in this location between this mattress store and the Chase Bank, which makes sense because that put it right next to the Santa Monica Airline, which was actually converted to today's E-Line and it's right across the street from the substation that housed all the electrical equipment. It's a theater now. Change has been ongoing ever since. This pedestrianized area used to be Washington Boulevard cutting straight through downtown Culver back in 1989. By 1994, the area immediately around the Culver Hotel was pedestrianized, and it remained this way with this ridiculous parking lot right in the middle until 2019 when the entire area was pedestrianized. Pedestrianization was great for people, but it forced through traffic circuitously through Culver Boulevard, which doesn't really work because this is a downtown area for business and pleasure to be conducted, not for traffic to go through. With five traffic lights in a row and six lanes bottlenecking down to two, even the most optimized traffic lights aren't going to help because as soon as one of these lights turns red during rush hour, it's pandemonium. So let's see what we have to work with and see if we can design around that. We have four large parking structures here, a couple car dependent businesses, one light rail line, and bus lanes on Venice. So there's some east-west transit accessibility, but for the most part, people are going to have to drive here.
And the only time there's an issue is during rush hour, which tells me that it's the people driving through here that's the problem, not the people driving to here. I also want to take some time to acknowledge people with disabilities. One of our goals in treating people with disabilities is to help them regain as much functional independence as possible. On one hand, car-oriented development actively hinders this, with a focus on the comfort of drivers while ignoring the comfort of those outside of their cars. I recommend watching Wheels No Heels videos to get a sense of what it's like to experience that in a wheelchair. This is a bit busier, this uh, leg of the journey, and this is my most hated leg of the journey because this sidewalk or pavement is really uneven and it's, um, what would you say, gravelly texture? The texture yeah, of it. It's rough texture, isn't it? It's got a really rough texture. So that causes fatigue with the vibrations up through my body and it also causes resistance so it's harder to push. But as an area becomes more pedestrianized, it becomes more pleasant for people of all ages and abilities to just exist there. On the other hand, cars can be the only way for the disabled to get to those places. I previously made a video that touched on how a functioning public transit system can enhance the independence of those who are otherwise mobility impaired, so disabled people wouldn't have to rely on family members or hire drivers or modify their own cars to allow them to drive. Another great channel is Wheels to Walking. These videos really help you understand the spectrum of disabilities that people have and the adjustments they have to make in life to maximize their function. Most of the time, I use my wheelchair to get around, but whenever I get the opportunity, I like to use my other tools instead. Some people think as I use a wheelchair, but I can't even walk at all. This has caused some really funny reactions in the past. Dude, that guy just got out of his wheelchair and walked. Bullshit. He even talks about his experience taking public transit. Catch a shuttle to Ikea. See, they plan ahead and put a caution wet floor sign here, because if you look closely, there's piss stains right here in the corner. And that's kind of the issue. We're all looking for a dignified way to get around. Even as someone without a disability, it makes me feel helpless, insulted, and disrespected when a bus doesn't show up for 20 minutes. And that's as a person who can hop on his bike or car at any time he wanted to. So, using a harm reduction approach, is there any way that can combine maintaining access to LA's market area in one of the few places in LA that has a dense commercial and office district, takes advantage of the fact that this neighborhood was actually designed around rail infrastructure and improves accessibility for all ages and abilities? Actually, there is. It's a mall. Or wait, no, not a shopping mall, a transit mall. A transit mall is basically a car light main street that's designed around efficient uses of transit rather than the personal automobile. Now I know what some of you are thinking. Are you even from here? That's Europe! And you may not have noticed, but this isn't Europe. Well, let me scratch that itch for you. But Culver City was designed for the car! I hate to break it to you, but Culver Boulevard was designed as a transit mall. Which means if we're going to reimagine Culver Boulevard, it should be as a transit mall. So here's how I would redesign downtown Culver. First, just copy and paste San Francisco's car light area of Market Street's transit mall with center running bus lanes and one mixed traffic lane in each direction. The only issue that needs solving is discouraging through traffic. And this can be addressed by strategically placing bollards here and here. And then make Main Street a one-way street with no street parking. Kind of like how this street in Montreal went from this to this. This gives plenty of extra space for things like parklets or loading zones for people to pick up their propane and propane accessories. Chicago has the Windy City Smokeout, maybe this gives us the space to do the Culver City Smokeout. People coming from the west can park at the Main Street parking garage or exit through Main Street. People coming from the east can do the same. People leaving this garage can head east or north. And of course, buses travel unimpeded. Where do the bikes go? Well, in my experience, when cars are driving slowly, they're actually very respectful of bicyclists. Like this car that was giving me a lot of space until I felt safe to wave him by and let him on his way. So this may be surprising, but I think Sharrows would work here, especially with these bollards acting as modal filters. We can also take a page out of Denver's transit mall playbook. 
We can use pavers to provide a comfortable surface to walk on and signal that this is a place for people and cars are just a guest here. With all the extra space on the sides, we can throw in some green space and with this now unused road, throw in a playground. It would be nice to have more public space just to exist. And what about the traffic that wants to get through here? Well, that's what Venice Boulevard is for. And yes, I know the traffic is already really bad there. And while I can make an entire video on how I would fix Venice Boulevard, let me just make two quick suggestions. First, it's ridiculous that they took away a lane for buses to come down these lanes only every 10 minutes. That's six buses every hour, when hundreds of cars are traveling through here during the same time. When I'm sitting on Venice Boulevard and I see no buses and instead see cars going down these lanes, I'm not even mad. If a bus doesn't show up for 10 minutes, to me, it's not even a bus lane. In London, trains come as fast as every two minutes. In Chicago's bus lanes, buses come as frequently as every six minutes. If buses came here every six minutes, then every six minutes drivers would be reminded that there's a faster way to get around. More people would see the bus as a viable transportation option, and that would free up the roads for those who need to drive. Also, whose idea was it to put highway ramps here right at the confluence of the 10, Venice Boulevard, and downtown Culver? Just get rid of those. It's embarrassing. Especially since there are freeway ramps literally a mile away in each direction, which I prefer to take to downtown Culver just to avoid that mess at Venice. Oh, and Camfield? Pedestrianize that. Just like they did with Griffith Park Road up at Silver Lake. This road is just redundant. And while we're at it, let's just bring back the Culver Boulevard tram line. It can share the corridor with the buses, just like the streetcars on Market Street do. And let's extend that all the way up to WeHo, so we can expand the market area for downtown Culver and connect it to another major downtown. Oh, and let's add a brand new tram line connecting UCLA, Westwood, Pico, Palms, Culver, and Playa Vista, also expanding the market area for downtown Culver and connecting all these major new development areas. Oh, and while we're expanding rail, the car traffic at La Cienega is crazy! And it's all coming from the airport. So let's make an actually useful light rail line that connects LAX with the La Cienega E-Line station, the West LA Kaiser Medical Center, and WeHo. Which would make the Northern K-Line extension directly to Hollywood a no-brainer, but okay, I think I'm getting ahead of myself here. I think one of the reasons traffic is so bad in LA is because this city was originally designed around mass transit and streetcars, and once we replaced all of that with freeways and the personal automobile, that just caused us to spread everything out, which made public transit get stuck in traffic, and forced businesses and people to depend on cars, and only cars, to get around. And now, since everything is designed around car travel, there isn't enough room to get to our destinations quickly, and once we're there, there isn't enough room to explore what our communities have to offer. But I think with a little bit of foresight, we can create pleasant, car light communities and support our steamy romance bookstores at the same time.